So today, uh, this talk's basically, yeah? That's not important. Um, is it just for that, yeah? Okay. C can you hear me? Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so this talk is basically going to cover just a few concepts. We're gonna look at the basics of uh, what a blockchain is and what makes Ethereum special. Uh, we're gonna look at the risk landscape of these technologies. Uh, we're gonna look at some historical blunders and then no demo, sorry guys. So uh, I'm the co-founder of a company called iSyro. Uh, we do blockchain security stuff. If you're interested, come talk to me. Uh, I used to work at MWR, uh, used to hack mobile phone stuff, and I like to talk about investing in crypto stuff because I know you guys care. Um, so let's dive straight into the basics of things. Um, okay, so who here owns Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency of any type? Okay, cool. Um, the guys who don't own any, or like, and how many people don't own any Bitcoin or anything? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so the guys who, who don't own Bitcoin, I'm sure if you guys uh, ask the guys who do have Bitcoin, it's a very, very cool experience just to receive a little bit of it. It's a very easy process. And if you get onto it, you'll realize that it's a very useful technology to, to be a part of. And now um, the blockchain, the underlying technology of what we'll be talking about today, it's basically a public database. And it's all over the internet. Um, and all the data is validated and tamper evidence. Okay, a lot of people say it's immutable. That's not quite true. We'll get into that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, so if we look at the actual underlying tech of a blockchain, uh, you start out with a single block and there's a whole chain of blocks before this. Uh, all of the miners on the network will try to form the next block on the blockchain. Um, sorry, who here knows what a blockchain is? Cool, awesome, so just the gist of it. Um, so you're gonna put all the uh, transactions into a single block, uh, you're gonna do some proof of work, and then you are going to attach it to the chain. Okay, so who here knows why you have proof of work? Someone, anyone, answer, yeah? Uh, to make it, sure you can't change anything in the box? To make sure you can't change anything in the box? It's really difficult to, yeah. or expensive to attack Exactly. So, I mean, there are alternatives to this, like proof of stake, for example, which Ethereum is moving to now, or POA, which is proof of authority. But what's interesting is that only proof of work uh, blockchains are immutable in, in, in some sense. They're actually uh, tamper proof. Because if you look at all these other technologies that are being implemented at the moment, like proof of stake, for example, they don't have that same electricity requirement or the hashing power requirement of proof of work blockchains. So that's a, quite a nice distinction to make that the next time that you're having an argument with somebody over why Bitcoin has value, for example, because nation states have limited electricity and it's, it's quite a unique blockchain in itself. Um, so yeah, this process just keeps continuing and you form your blockchain. Smart contracts, who here knows about smart contracts? Just trying to gauge the level of tech I need to get into here. Okay, so not too many people. So the basic concept here is you take code, you put it onto the blockchain, okay? The basic idea behind this is that you have code that you can trust. You know what it's going to produce at the end of the day. So when you have something like insurance or you have a will that needs to pay out when you die, I personally don't trust Suntum to pay me when my laptop gets stolen, but I will trust code on the blockchain. Uh, so, so that's quite an interesting distinction or like quite an interesting capability of it. Uh, this is all implemented in Solidity for the most part. Sorry, I feel like I'm gonna drop this thing. Um, Solidity. So you also get uh, 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 Viper, which is kind of like a Python implementation. Uh, but most people use Solidity at the moment, which kind of looks like JavaScript. Uh, you can see uh, the syntax of it here. You've got contracts and then, yeah, it looks very similar to JavaScript. 
if you are familiar with it. Um, then the concept of gas, so the ability to make, put code onto the blockchain begs the question of if people all over the world are going to be running this code and they can say that you can run any code that you want, what prevents somebody from just dosing the network by putting some like for loop or, or while loop in the code? Um, so that's why the concept of gas is introduced into the system. Gas basically associates a price uh, for any operation that's executed in the system. And that's independent of the Ethereum price. So some of you might have heard of gas uh, and seen it on like coin map market cap, for example. That's gas for NEO. So that's a different use case. Gas in this sense is only in an Ethereum sense. And you don't ever actually transact in gas. It's only ever, um, you only, when you make a transaction, you basically specify uh, the gas price that you're willing to pay. So if you move up your gas price, you're willing to pay miners more per transaction. That's, uh, that allows for certain attacks that we'll get into later. Um, but yeah, so if you have like a very important uh, transaction that you need to do, set a high gas price, you set the maximum gas limit. So that's how much are you willing to pay in total for the transaction. Um, and then as long as that is all less than a certain amount of uh, the block gas limit, then that transaction can happen. And that limit on the amount of gas that you can use makes Ethereum Turing complete. So uh, like Bitcoin, for example, it has a scripting language, but it's quite limited. You can't do certain things like have uh, extensive loops, uh, which you can do in Ethereum. So that's worth noting. Um, so if we look at the risk landscape of it, um, you should read these quotes because they're quite funny. Um, if we look at the risk landscapes, who, who have actually, or who here has heard about um, some of the attacks, like the DAO hack, for example? Okay, cool. So yeah, we'll get into those. But I mean, it's it's a bit of a dog show right now in in this space. Uh, these are just smart contract hacks. So these aren't even like Bitfinex getting hacked a couple of years ago, or like websites getting hacked or anything like that. This is just smart contracts. So at the top, we've got the DAO, three point six million ether. That is close to like $1.5 billion worth of ether, okay? Fortunately, they forked, so it's worth a fraction of that currently. Um, in parity multisig, this actually happened uh, at the beginning of November. So, I mean, these things are still happening today. Uh, we're actually gonna be diving into these top three. Um, but, I mean, if you look at the hacker gold, for example, $400,000, that was because the dev said equals plus rather than plus equals. Yeah, so the interesting thing is that you've got this code that like, you put onto the blockchain, you can't change it, and it's just it's holding so much money. So if we look at some of the risks involved in this, uh, the first step uh, is the off-chain risks. So this has nothing to do with actual Ethereum technology. It just has to do with the way that you interact with it. So if you look at like forum hacks getting, or forums getting hacked, or like decentralized applications getting hacked, um, those, that's happening at like a high, high level, right? You've also got phishing attacks. So if you've ever participated in like an ICO, for example, or sent ether to somebody to participate in something, um, you'll oftentimes get phishing emails because it's so easy to steal the money and it's so, easy, it's so difficult to actually track down who's stealing it from you. And then the last point, compromised oracles. So an oracle in, uh, in this sense basically means, if, if you come back to the example of a will, um, you need to find out when somebody has died, right? So you can plug into a database in the government which will tell you, okay, this death certificate has been registered for this individual so you know that they're dead. But you need that API, that untrusted connection with the outside world into the, the blockchain world and that's what an oracle is. So uh, earlier this year, NASDAQ actually had a massive screw up where they were reporting the wrong numbers to Yahoo, Google, um, uh, MSN and so on. Uh, so the wrong financial details. So if you had posted uh, financial contracts which said pay a certain amount out uh, when the stocks reach a certain price, all of those smart contracts would have broken based off of the oracles, nothing to do with the contracts. Uh, then if we move a layer down to the blockchain, so this is quite interesting. So you've got mining risks. Um, so typical attacks like a 51% attack where you earn most of the hashing power on the network so you're able to put in invalid transactions or malicious transactions. 
hard forks. So if you look at like uh, Ethereum versus Ethereum Classic, what happened there, or you can get other forks like Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin, where they've got different philosophical outcomes. Um, consensus splits again, where people don't agree on things. DOS attacks. So you can see again, if you're looking at the Bitcoin uh, holds the saga with all the forks. What's happened on the main chain now is that zero value transactions. So if you make transactions with no value, um, miners aren't really incentivized to actually place those transactions in the block. So they aren't, so it just clogs up the network. So people can just spam out all of these transactions and nothing gets mined and it gets slow and it's terrible. And then you get protocol bugs. So in 2010, uh, 92 billion Bitcoin was brought into existence through a bug. Uh, that was quickly sorted out, but yeah, these things happen. Okay, so the last layer down is just the smart contracts themselves. So here you have immutable code. So once you've actually put your code onto the blockchain, there's not really a way to change it. Um, the only way that currently exists to change code on the blockchain or on the Ethereum blockchain is through upgradable uh, techniques, right? So you get something like uh, upgrade delegate proxy where you can basically say, say now you've got one contract that points to another contract. This contract can operate as a proxy. So it says, if you ever call me, delegate it out to other proxies. And then you can just keep changing where this one contract points to. Um, so that gives you a way to actually change your code base. But now you've defeated the whole point of the blockchain, right? So this brings into question governance issues of if I don't want to give the ability to change contracts to a small group of developers, how do I actually control the decisions that get made? So people are doing a lot of work around this voting mechanisms like carbon voting, for example, where you can like pledge tokens or value to say that you actually, you will put your money behind something. Then you get EVM bugs. Uh, so EVM is basically the Ethereum virtual machine. And th there have been some bugs in the past around that, uh, lack of tooling. So again, this is a very young ecosystem. So things like formal verification, uh, static code analysis, these tools are busy developing, but they're not, they're not quite there yet. So it is a work in progress. And then last of all, we have the smart contract vulnerabilities. So this is, this is actually why I got into this in the first place, because the vulnerabilities that you find here are very different to traditional bugs that you get. I mean, something like um, front running, for example, where, you know earlier how I referenced the fact that gas price, by setting it high, you can actually get in front of other people. So now imagine you were to create a lottery where you had a million dollar payout, right? And all of a sudden, and all that you had to do was guess the right number to actually get the money out. And as the lottery owner, I could just watch the network for submissions. When I pick up a correct submission, I just set a very high gas price. I changed the lottery payout to be zero dollars, and that's it, right? So that, that's one example. We're going to dive into some other examples of like reentrancy and um, what else is cool? Uh, time ordering dependency as well. So like, say now you want to um, create random numbers on the through Solidity, for example. Um, this is actually quite difficult to do. Some people try to use timestamps, for example, but miners actually have the ability to affect timestamps. They can go plus minus 90 seconds out of all the other miners. So they can actually bias random numbers in their own, uh, like, uh, what's the word? Like a uh, preference, I guess. <laughs> Favor, thank you. Cool. So now I guess let's, let's dive into some of the actual hacks that have happened in the past. So the first one, the parity hack. So this happened on a multi-sig wallet. So the idea behind a multi-sig wallet is that you require multiple signatures, multiple people to sign for a single transaction to happen. So this would be used, say now you've got a, a company with three directors and you require two of those directors to, to verify any transaction that were to happen, right? So if one of them gets compromised, it's not the end of the world. Right, so you think that you're actually secure as a result of this, but because you're adding code complexity and additional functionality, you're increasing the attack surface. And that's a very bad thing in this system. So what's interesting is if you've ever used like Copay, for example, for Bitcoin, that's another multi-sig wallet, but that happens off-chain. Bitcoin wallets uh, that are multi-sig are off-chain, whereas Ethereum ones are on-chain, so they can be attacked. 
And uh, yeah, so it was 514k ether, so that's what, like 250 million dollars-ish currently at the current price. And then yeah, it entailed a couple of bugs. So if we dive into it, uh, at the top there, you see what's called a, a fallback function. Sorry, I don't have a point on it. Yeah, you've um, got a fallback function, which basically means if you look at all these other functions, you'll see how they have like is owner, has confirmed, get owner. That one doesn't have an, a name that is specified. So that basically means if you just send ether to the contract, or if you don't, if you specify a function call that isn't in this contract, it goes straight there, and then it will say uh, if there is actually ether sent to it then deposit it, like you would expect from a wallet. Uh, otherwise, delegate it to the, the library, okay? And then at the bottom here, you'll see that there's a wallet library with an address. So that basically, that's like pointing to the wallet code. So if you ever get a call that's not in this contract, just send it straight to, to this wallet address. Now, the reason for doing that is basically whenever you deploy a code onto the blockchain, uh, you're charged uh, gas fees for putting it putting there. So you want to minimize the amount of code that you actually deploy in instances where you have to deploy it on, for every single user. So like a wallet, for example, where every user who uses it has to have their own wallet. So in order to minimize that cost, you put the bulk of that code into a library, you deploy it once, and then you make all your users reference that one library. However, that creates a, a single point of failure. So it's a bit of a trade-off. So... If we go into, uh, oh, sorry, so just to clarify, so there's a delegate call into your wallet library. So if we go into the actual library now, we'll see the init wallet function, which take note of the slide, we'll be coming back here later in the second half. Oh, sorry, yeah, in the second half. Um, so if you look at this, it's actually quite simple. Uh, they had a couple of major issues that shouldn't have been there. If you see this code here, the only many owners, so that syntax, that's, it's called a modifier. So Solidity has this really cool feature in it where you can s specify a modifier that will run every single time that a, a certain function is called. And only if that call is actually valid will it continue on with the rest of the code. In it wallet, you can see there's no modifier there. There's no guard protecting it from malicious things happening. And so if the wallet's already been initialized, well, you can initialize it again. Okay, that's not a good thing. So that was mistake number one, is that it had no guard. Um, mistake number two is that there's no scope. So you can see, oh, yeah, Solidity it has uh, three different scopes. You've got public, which means that any contract, sorry, anybody can call any of these things. So like as an attacker, you can just send, uh, make a transaction to init wallet or kill, and then it will run those things, right? That's public. You get private, which means only within that contract can you call it. And then you get something called internal, which means that itself, as well as any derived contracts. So exa for example, like the wallet calling the wallet library. So this should have been internal so that only the wallets could talk to each other. So coming back to this function here, this operated pretty much as a catch all statement, this delegate call. So, that, so basically as an attacker, you have an attack vector that goes straight in to delegate call by just making sure that you don't specify a function that's in here and um, by not s sending any value to it, by sending no ether. And so now you've got the entire attack path to basically initialize the wallet as your own. During that initialization process, you become the owner of the contract and then you have access to all that ether. And <laughs> So here's the, uh, here's the patch that was pushed shortly thereafter. You can see internal at the top there, internal there, and this is the guard here, only initialized. And so the takeaway from this, the three people who were affected by this, Eternity, Edgeless Casino, and Swarm City, the takeaway, don't put an infinity sign in your logo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay, a couple of weeks ago, the second hack happened. Uh, well, it's not really a hack, uh, but again, it was a multi-sig functionality. So again, this, the reason this is so scary is that this is us, right? We use multi-sigs. Ordinary people don't, like, they don't really care. But just because you're using a multi-sig, you're affected by this. 514K ether, that's, that's a lot of money right there, right? And the bugs involved, so uninitialized contract and kill functionality. 
So, look who we have again. <laughs> so basically all that happened was they didn't initialize the library itself. And so an att attacker, this guy on GitHub basically said that uh, he was trying to deploy a wallet and that was buggy and he wasn't sure what he was doing. So he tried to init the wallet, which was a library. He gained ownership of the library itself. And remember, it's a single point of failure. So when he was stupid enough to call kill, it broke it for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, okay, so, sorry, uh, everyone who deployed the new contract since the previous hack. Yeah. So that, that wasn't good either. Um, yeah, moving on to the DAO hack. This was actually literally what happened with the popcorn and everything. Uh, so the DAO is basically a decentralized autonomous organization, which means it's a, uh, a company that's, it, all of its functionality has been, uh, or is intended to be programmed, right? Uh, so it doesn't actually require any individuals to do anything within the organization. It's just all, uh, it happens at a programmatic level. And at the time that it was hacked, it held about 14% of all ether, which is a scary amount. 3.6 million, yeah, I gave you the numbers earlier. Um, and it used a reentrancy bug, uh, which is kind of difficult to understand at first if you haven't seen it before. But if you think about a typical transaction, let's say you've got an individual who wants to transact with a wallet contract. The first step is they'll indicate that they want to withdraw their balance. Their balance is 100 tokens. And the, the wallet itself actually holds 1,000 tokens because there's 10 other users, say, or nine other users. Um, so it's going to send the credits out, and it's going to update the balance. And then at the top there, you'll have, OK, the user's balance is 0, it's 900. OK, cool. But the thing is that you can send, make these transactions as another contract, right? So you can do something quite sneaky. When you withdraw, it's going to transfer the credits. But because you actually have this wallet's uh, tension at this stage, or uh, not, not tension, what's, what's the right word for this? You, you've basically got, um, it's going to pause execution, waiting on you to respond to it, basically. Okay, so you can call withdraw again before it has updated its own balance. And you can cause a re uh, recursive instance that will basically keep withdrawing until the wallet runs out of money, okay? And then it will update the balance. So in this instance, there are just two withdrawals, so it updates 800. Um, so that's, that's basically what reentrancy is. Now, this was the DAO code. Um, you can see specifically these two lines are withdraw a reward for a message of sender and this balances where you set it equal to zero, right? Now, had they just reversed these two lines, uh, it would have actually been fixed because when you call back into the contract, the balance would already be zero, right? But because it's programmed like this, it's going to keep hitting withdraw reward for each time that you call into it. Um, so here you can, uh, it just goes in, so here's the withdrawal for uh, payout, and then uh, if you go into that function, you'll see this code here. So you can see it's recipient.call.value. So what that is, it's basically a low-level call into a solidity transfer function to transfer tokens. Currently, there are better ways to make transfers, like if you use .transfer or .send, it limits the amount of gas that uh, the transfer has. So if you think about it, um, if you're making a recursive call, you're going to run out of gas. It's actually, it's a very small amount of gas, just enough to log an error message. Um, so when you try to make that recursive call, it's just going to fail. Uh, so this bug isn't really that common anymore because you need to specifically call dot value to exploit it. Um, so yeah, just coming back to this one, if they had reversed those two, uh, it, it would have fixed it. Um, fortunately, a lot of static, uh, and analysis tools uh, actually detect this type of behavior now because it's quite easy to pick up automatically. Yeah, so I guess the takeaway from this is um, it's a very, very young technology. I didn't realize 
how early on it is for these types of technologies. If you look at like the scaling questions now, interoperability, like all these major questions around how, how is this actually going to work? They haven't been answered yet. People see the massive like $50 billion market cap and they say, okay, well, this must be awesome. No, it's still very young. So it's a, it's a great time to be getting into this type of technology. And just the last point is uh, Andreas Antonopoulos. He's an awesome guy to follow. Uh, he has this great point about Bitcoin, which is sewer rats versus bubble boys. So if you think about sewer rats, they live in the streets of New York, it's the, in, the, in the drains, in the sewers, in the most disgusting places ever, right? And they're exposed to all of these terrible diseases and just like if they can survive, they're going to be the most badass, like, yeah, uh, what's the word? Um, like just strong and uh, like animals around, right? So sewer rats are like blockchains, right? They're in the public. Anybody can attack them. Uh, you can do anything that you want to them. There's currently over a $100 billion bounty on Bitcoin if you can hack it, right? So that creates a very strong technology. Whereas if you look at the banks that have all of their technology hidden from the outside world, and they're kind of like padded by these bubble suits, you don't know what's going to happen when somebody gets in there. So that's why you have to ask yourself, like, okay, there's been some major hacks here, but is that such a bad thing, actually? Like, those hacks have happened, they're out of the way, they're not going to happen again. So that's the core distinction you need to make. And like I said, sorry, guys, the demo, it actually broke. It's, it's not going so well. So that's actually the end of the talk. Yeah. Yeah? Sorry. Sorry. an article like trigger a contract? So in the case of someone's death, it might happen 30 years later. Like, mm. what, is, what is watching for that event or polling or like, what triggers it? Yeah, so, so there's quite a few different solutions to this right now. Uh, like if you're interested in specific technologies, like uh, Oracleize is one of the major ones right now. And now you pretty much have to rely on the fact that these people are going to be, um, they'll, they'll have like certain SLAs in place around what they can deliver to you, and you have to rely on the fact that they're monitoring on a regular basis. Um, so, so like you'll have an article specifically for like the deeds office or for like uh, NASDAQ prices, for example. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Like they'll- Outside, outside service that triggers yeah. the site. It's not that the network and the miners trigger. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Which, which brings in a massive like, as I said earlier, like it's a big, um, I wouldn't say loophole, but like it's a massive question right now about how do you actually verify that data and not introduce security risks into the system. Yeah. Yeah, and so I mean there are some interesting technology or like solutions to this. Um, I mean, if you look at Arclize or if you look at uh, Neo, for example, um, they basically rely on the fact that your reputation is very important, and if you can tell who submitted the incorrect data. So if you look at um, I, I don't know, say now uh, NASDAQ screws up and you can pinpoint it on NASDAQ and you lost $50 million due to this, don't use NASDAQ anymore, right? It's kind of the free market speaking. Uh, so there's that uh, transparency about who's responsible for things happening. Yeah. Sorry, there's a question back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when I actually saw the, that this talk was going to happen, I was really excited about it and it's a great talk. Um, the complexity stuff, didn't they add more complexity by coming up with a solidity? I mean, for instance, <laughs> if you look at Stellar, the mm. guy thinks Stellar based it off JavaScript. You know, it's something that has been tested. Not that I'm saying JavaScript is perfect, but to have something battle tested and then mm. use it rather for <coughs> random technology. And the second one, I can't, is it called ECR20? Yeah, ERC20, ERC yeah. Yeah, ERC20 tokens are that. Another potential issue on Ethereum, everyone else basing it on their chain, mm. adds more complexity, adds more potential vulnerabilities as well. Sure. So, on your Solidity points, absolutely agreed. Like, <laughs> Solidity is the core issue behind everything here. All, all the bugs that have happened. It's people are really struggling to code in it securely because it's it's a different paradigm. There's quite a few things that you need to understand behind it. That's why. Uh, Neo as well, they have, um, they've got more familiar languages for people to code in. Uh, it's a massive advantage for those people. So Solidity is not, uh, I mean, it is JavaScript-esque, yeah. but it's not JavaScript. Um, 
So yeah, noted that one. And then your second point on ERC-20. So for those of you people who don't know, ERC-20 is basically a token standard uh, in the um, if, uh, that was developed by uh, the Ethereum community. So if you want to launch a new token, like on an ICO, for example, you can make it have this standard and then you can plug it into things like exchanges or other wallets so that it displays nicely and that you've got integration across the board. Now, I'm not sure I would say that that really introduces additional complexity because if you look at the alternative case, you basically re require people to either come up with their own blockchains or to like fork another one, you know? Well, the problem is that generally they launch a Ethereum mm. smart contract to begin the ICO. So already you're putting straight on the network by doing 200 different ICOs. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, look, you also get uh, scaling solutions to this. I mean, if you look at some of the stuff being proposed at the moment with sharding, for instance, or if you've got, um, what's that thing called? Uh, sorry, my mind's skipping it right now. But you've basically got technologies that are basically trying to have your main blockchain, and then you'll have child blockchains. Side yeah, exactly. But there's, um, sorry, there's the one specifically for Ethereum that's just skipping my mind. Um, and those technologies can be settled off chain and then committed onto the chain later. And you could use something like that to solve this ICO issue because you'll, you'll actually be able to detect, if you use Ethereum on a, like an hourly basis, you'll be able to see when an ICO is going on because there's such an effect on the network. But I don't think that's necessarily a security issue, right? I mean, that's, that's more of a scaling issue that will be addressed over time. I think un, if people do use ERC-20 tokens, they're a lot better off than any other ecosystem currently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for those of us who've maybe gone the lunar route, bought Bitcoin, bought Ethereum now, and mm -hmm. wallet, how do we progress from just holding some to writing contracts? Do we need to go to a separate wallet provider? Do we need to run a client on a machine? Like, how do we write the equivalent of the Hello World and do something? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, I wish I could have done the demo for you. So, okay, you get Remix, which is a super easy browser, um, like you can just, you can actually, they've got a URL that you go to and then you can deploy contracts onto the blockchain in your browser, right? And that, that's really straightforward. Uh, there's also a really nice framework called Truffle, which basically packages everything you need uh, into a single client or framework where you can uh, write your Solidity code, you can write uh, unit tests and every, and like actual migration. So like, if you've got multiple contracts that depl uh, depend on each other, you can set up the order that they get uh, deployed to the network um, and like any configuration things. So uh, to answer your question, I check out Remix. Um, it's really not that difficult to get into. It's like just, it's as easy as any, picking up any other type of coding practice, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. But if anybody is interested in getting, in writing smart contracts, just come speak to me afterwards and I'll show you how easy it is, yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions? It's kind of an end question, because mm -hmm. like, because this is like securing the network and securing like the, the proof of stuff. But how do you actually secure the value? Because I mean, like, let's say I get paid in Bitcoin at work. Yeah. And if I work this month and then the next month it's like my salary is going to be different and so forth. So is anyone doing like any work on securing the value? It's more like a philosophical kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is just to, it was basically how, how do we stabilize the value of Bitcoin? And, yeah, or, uh, yeah, okay, so some cryptocurrencies won't necessarily face this. I mean, like, if you look at Tether, for example, Tether's intention isn't to go to the moon, um, but they're probably going to go the other direction. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so I think... Look, there is a philosophical question here, and ultimately, most people who need to answer this question aren't, they don't actually want the value to be pegged to a dollar value, right? Like, for myself, I'm happy to take payments in Bitcoin. In fact, for clients of ours, we give them a discount for paying us in Bitcoin, and we don't change it based off of the US dollar price, right? Because if you buy into the actual ecosystem of it, and like the philosophy behind it you don't need to, you don't care about what the price is i mean like if you think about south africa um okay the the rand fluctuates against the dollar and sure like that can affect like import rates or whatever but i mean that doesn't change like the amount of money that you are charging your clients on that daily basis right as the dollar is fluctuating 
So you kind of need to buy into the actual asset that you're purchasing, or the, sorry, the currency that you are purchasing. Um, to answer your, your question, yeah. There's, I don't really think there's going to be a way to ever stabilize it against other currencies. Uh, yeah. It just looks like if you look at the ECR money, money uh, dollars were a strong unit. Mm. And then it became kind of weak. That's what you pay for the dollars. Once fiat currency now is pretty good, back in DC, the whole, I think it's, I think the core is basically, the French wanted all the gold back. Yeah. All the case that that's weak. But like, it's just the whole thing, like, is there crypto that's actually a crypto? <laughs> if you're serious about that, come speak to me afterwards, because I happen to know someone. Uh, yeah? So, uh, since what I have, considering that you obviously know about smart contracts, security and stuff, how do you secure your own crypto? How do you secure If you have any crypto, uh, how do you secure it? Uh, okay, so, so basically, um, the typical, like, uh, Best practice here, hardware wallets, trezzles, um, whatever. Um, that's, you use uh, cold storage or like deep free storage, like stuff you're never gonna access. You keep on a hardware wallet in a safe that's never gonna be touched. Then you've got the next level up from that. So that's more your, your actual cold wallet. So that's again a hard wallet, uh, sorry, hardware wallet. Then you've got your hot wallet, which is basically uh, daily transactions, which again, can be a, either a separate uh, hardware wallet or the same one. Uh, and that's generally, I mean, like some people, as long as you're not putting it on an exchange, like it's not that bad. Yeah? Sorry, I actually made it a bit more like what you do yourself. So uh, I also swap between cold and exchange. Yeah. Obviously exchange, it's not preferred because they've got my private keys. Yeah. But the ability to trade at a fraction of the yeah. time, getting it out of my cold storage, you keep a kind of 50 do you have a long game and then you keep some for smart contracts and stuff like that? Uh, well, to be honest with you, so the, like the smart contract side of things, the only smart contracts I operate with are ICOs or like to invest with. Um, I don't, I haven't found any dApps I actually like or like decentralized applications which you normally use Ethereum for. Um, so I don't actually, uh, most of my funds are in a cold wallet to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, like the, the uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. You don't have to go into detail, just wanted to kind of. Yeah, but. Obviously, no one, I mean, no one even says it's Facebook. Yay, Ethereum's up. Yeah. Um, and then, sorry, the last thing, decentralized apps, have you looked at that at all? Because the smart contracts at least are going in a more secure direction now, but most of the decentralized apps I looked at, it was, it was basically just marketing jumbo and mm. like, don't worry, it'll be secure because we're sending you everything. Yeah, and it's on the blockchain. Like, yeah. Wait, sorry, you're sending the database and everything. Mm. Okay, <laughs> good luck with getting that right. Yeah, no, I, to be honest with you, I haven't really looked at dApps too much, the security aspect of it. I think it's a very interesting space to be, to be looking at. But I, honestly, I haven't even found quality dApps at the moment. Yeah. So, like, it's not, it's too uh, premature, I think, yeah. yeah. So earlier on you mentioned the re-entry attack, and that looks kind of like um, it looks kind of like a race condition vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I'm thinking with the centralized ledger that is like eventually consistent. I mean, is that a common pattern? Are race are race condition based vulnerabilities? Pattern? Well, okay. So basically, this is it's not really a race condition because you. It's more about the context of the call, right? It jumps between contracts. So you're not really racing anything. You just, uh, if the one contract had finished its own process while the other one was finishing, I mean, like that would make it a ra uh, race condition. But in this sense, it was jumping between them. And because the, let me just go back to the slide, sorry. Is that a sufficient Yes. So that seems more like time of take, time of use, right? Exa exactly, exactly. Um, because your actual context is like, you're going from here, and then when this guy should be updating, it's ac the, the context is over there. So I don't think, uh, to answer your actual question, sorry, was um, race conditions uh, in this space. Um, I can't really think of, I mean, like a, a better example of a race condition would be uh, where if you see some of these, uh, like lotteries, for example, or if you look at, um, like being able to uh, get your transaction 
process before somebody else. So like if you're a miner on the network and you're able to like uh, push your uh, transaction ahead, or if you're able to clog the network and slow it down for everyone, um, those are bigger concerns. Yeah, I guess that would be the type of race conditions you're talking about. And um, time check versus time of use, is that common or was this just kind of common? Yeah, no, that's, that's common. There's a few vulnerabilities like um, if you look at, uh, what's it called now? Um, yeah, th there, are, there are a few to answer your question. It's not just re-entrancy, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? So who's participated in ICO, anyone? Not fast enough. Not fast enough, yeah. So that part of the problem is that people know about ICO, so they automate it and just yeah. basically clog up the, the queue. So if you're one guy, you're never going to get in. Yeah. If it's a good one, that is. Yeah, exactly. If anybody wants to go to the moon or drive a Lambo, like, investigate it. It's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's nice to participate in, uh, in it and see the actual. And as I said at the, at the beginning, like, if anybody here doesn't own Bitcoin, download a, a wallet. And even I will personally give you some Bitcoin. If it, if it has to come to that. But it's just, it's so easy. <laughs> Famous last words, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But once you buy into it, you just see how straightforward it is and how cheap it is and how practical it is. Like, I guess most people, they don't need to deal with international payments on a daily basis currently. But in the future, we're going to see that it's just, it, you can't compete against it. So I, I hope you guys take a look at it and see how cool it is. Yeah. Cool.